second of our Election Integrity Educational Series. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. Your time is valuable. We want to give you some excellent information today. We have Dr. Philip Stark with us today. We are so happy to be interviewing him. Um, he is a professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley campus. And Dr. Stark, would you tell us a little bit more about your credentials? Uh, in elections, um, I served on former Secretary of State Deborah Bowen's post-election audit standards working group. Um, that led to developing some new methods for auditing elections. Um, participated in pilots of those methods in uh, close to 20 counties in California, a couple of counties in Colorado, uh, a couple of grants from the Election Assistance Commission to implement these things, participated in the drafting of some laws around uh, the use of these methods. Um, I'm on the board of directors of Verified Voting Foundation. I'm on the advisory board of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. That is quite an impress impressive array of credentials, folks. We're, again, we're so glad to have Dr. Stark with us. So um, our viewers at home are election integrity novices. We are all learning as we're going along. Uh, most of our viewers um, are Bernie Sanders supporters and um, feel that there was possibly um, some shenanigans that have gone on in our elections. Um, we are very interested to find out about the audit work that you've been doing. Could you tell us a little bit in general about audits, and then we'll go a little more specific with, with your um, work. Sure. Well, in general, uh, for an election to be auditable, you need a durable record of how people voted. And right now that means paper. Uh, so if people are not voting on paper ballots or creating uh, a printed paper output like uh, some of the touchscreen voting machines that have the like cash register receipts that, that stay inside, then there really isn't a way to audit. Um, you can, if you're voting purely electronically with no paper trail, then the record of the votes can be altered without the possibility of detection with no forensic evidence. But if you do have a paper trail and it's curated well so that you know that at the end of the canvas, the paper still reflects how people, um, the people's intent, voter intent, then there's the opportunity to spot check the results, uh, the electronic results against the paper and uh, assess whether uh, the electronic results are accurate. Um, typically, the standard for accuracy that you care about isn't whether you got the exact vote count correct. That's essentially impossible, especially if you have voter mark paper ballots. Um, but a reasonable standard for accuracy is, did you name the right winners at the end of the day? Is the electoral outcome correct? Um, there are, so some states that have paper have laws around auditing. Some don't. Um, some come very close to even making it illegal to audit. Um, that's frightening. Yeah, well, um, that's politics. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the issue, I think, in most states right now, even those states that have paper, is that regulations and laws don't go far enough to ensure that the paper trail is curated well um, and that you really have uh, strong evidence that the paper itself is an accurate reflection of how people voted. If you don't have that, then the audit itself can't really show you very much um, because you're, you're checking something you d you're not entirely sure of against something you're not entirely sure of. Right, which is a great segue for us to talk about your specific work with risk-limiting audits. Could you tell us more about that? Well, the idea of a risk-limiting audit um, came uh, after the work on uh, Deborah Bowen's post-election audit standards working group. I looked at the methods that were out there, and largely um, they, they consisted of saying something like, take a random sample of precincts, recount the ballots by hand, say what you found. Um, and this didn't really seem to be a satisfactory endpoint mm -hmm. for an audit. Um, in particular, California's law uh, didn't require election officials to do anything if they, even if they found big errors. All they had to do was sort of report that they, mm -hmm. that they saw discrepancies um, and perhaps try to explain them. <clears throat> so uh, after a lot of head scratching, it occurred to me that what we would really like an audit to do is to correct the outcome of the election if the 
um, the results that we're about to report are wrong. Um, and if the, about, if the results we're about to report are right, then what the audit should do is as little work as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so you can think of a risk limiting audit as an intelligent incremental recount that stops the recount process as soon as there's really strong evidence that the recount would end up just showing the answer you already have. Okay. So for the 1% um, hand-counted paper ballot um, audit that some counties in the um, state of California um, are being pressured to do right now with uh, Ray Lutz's lawsuit, how does that differ from what your risk-limiting audit the statutory audit in California uh, requires looking at, um, I think it's the votes cast in 1% of precincts and uh, comparing a manual tally of those votes to the electronic results. Um, it's my understanding that California law requires tallying uh, not just those votes that are cast in person, but also votes that are cast by mail. Um, and I, I believe also votes that are cast provisionally, although the, the word provisional I think was struck from the recent, most recent revision of that law. It doesn't require, in some sense, the law has no teeth, right? It requires local election officials to do a certain amount of work, but if they find problems, um, it doesn't really require them to go out and, and you know, do whatever work would be necessary to make sure that at the end of the day the outcome is right. Um, nor is the level of scrutiny adequate if the margin is small. So if you think about, you know, what would you like the auditor to do? If you wanted to detect a problem, if there's a problem, and a problem means you got the outcome wrong, then the narrower the margin, the less error it would take to have altered the outcome of the contest, and so the more you have to look. Um, if the margins are wide, you don't have to do as much looking, because if there were enough error to have caused um, the wrong person to appear to win, that would be a lot of error. It would be very easy to find some. Um, so the 1% audit uh, is a, a holdover from the 1960s when we first started uh, using computers and voting in California. Um, it's not really, uh, in some cases, it's more work than the LEOs need to do, LEO meaning local election official, uh, really needs to do to verify things. And in other cases, it's not enough. But uh, either way, it doesn't end up... Um, giving you an assurance that the outcome is right um, or an assurance that the outcome will be corrected if the outcome is wrong. So would a risk-limiting audit be um, something that would be instituted in every county? Would it only be in um, counties where the vote was very close? How would that translate to from what we're doing now to what we could be doing to ensure more transparency in the system? Well, um, the risk, the word risk in a risk-limiting audit is the chance that you would fail to correct an outcome that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, in order to have an, uh, some kind of constraint on that chance, in order to control the chance that you would uh, certify an outcome that's wrong, you need to be drawing a sample of ballots from the entire contest, not just from what happens in one county. So if you're looking at something like the presidential election in California, you need to sample from all of the California counties. You can't just limit it to one. If you're talking about a mayoral contest, you only need to sample from the ballots, um, the, the people who are eligible to vote in that contest. Um, right now, there are a couple of laws in California that refer to risk limiting audits, but they're not part of the sort of overall auditing plan. That, you know, I guess SB 360 involves using risk limiting audits if uh, jurisdiction wants to pilot a new voting system, um, especially one that hasn't been federally certified. Uh, the state that has the um, most all-encompassing law regarding risk-limiting audits right now is Colorado, which as of 2018 is supposed to be using risk-limiting audits um, across the state. Uh, there are still details they need to be working out. Um, there's uh, the, the audit Methods that are used in New Mexico are pretty good and sort of go in the direction of risk limiting audits, although they're not quite that. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. Have I answered your question? Or? You know what? We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> We're getting there. Yes. Um, so um, you're passionate about this issue, and we could talk all day about this. And um, I, I can tell now that we would love to have you come back and go more in detail about this. So speaking, speaking of passion, um, Many of the people that have gotten involved in the election integrity movement 
um, have been moved um, by what they see is um, um, <clears throat> a very heart-wrenching situation where the right to vote has been fought for. People have died for the right to vote. And we're seeing some of the lowest voter turnout um, in history. In 2014, we had the lowest voter turnout since the mid-40s. In this past primary, we had 9, 9 million people show up to vote. 9%, um, 9% 9 of the um, of eligible Democratic voters show up. Um, this, is, um, this is alarming. Um, and what we would like to know um, is what, what moved you to get involved in the election integrity movement? Um, what was the hook for you? Um, it was really accidental. Um, it, it was somehow getting tapped to be on uh, Deborah Bellin's post-election audit standards working group. And <clears throat> that led to some really interesting intellectual questions. But um, I, I'm not a strongly political person and my involvement in election integrity is not because of my politics. It's more just a deep belief that if you manage to get to the polls and cast a vote, your vote ought to be counted accurately. Yes. Um, that's yes. It's pretty cut and dried, isn't it? It's pretty. It's 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 pretty clean. What's right and what's wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, could you tell us a little bit about? Um, how we do audits in the state of California? Um, well, uh, it varies enormously from county to county. Counties differ a lot in their logistics and how they handle and organize paper in the particular voting systems that they've deployed. Um, it's really uh, probably not the same in any two counties. Um, generally, you know, what you need to do is uh, know what the electronic results are for some batches of ballots, typically by precinct. Um, the precinct level counts, those, those counted, um, those cast in person and those cast by mail. Um, by the time the, you get to the end of the canvas, the status of provisional ballots is supposed to have been resolved, and those ballots are supposed to be included with those that were cast in person, and in fact, there should be no way to distinguish the provisionals from, uh, from the others at, at, after the provisional status is resolved. Then uh, what you're supposed to do is take a, a random sample of precincts and of batches of vote-by-mail ballots, um, count them by hand, and uh, compare the results to the electronic results and report what you find uh, to the Secretary of State's office. Does this differ greatly from how this audit process happens in other states? We were just talking about um, Colorado. Um, Colorado's audit is actually quite different uh, right now. Their statutory audit, not, not the risk limiting audit that will come into effect in 2018, but their statutory audit involves um, taking some stacks of ballots after the election um, running them through the, uh, the scanners or uh, equipment again and doing a hand tally of those batches and seeing whether they agree. Um, this is even worse than California's statutory audit because the batches that are being checked aren't even batches that correspond to the subtotals in the actual election. They're, they're ballots. Yeah, so you're things. not getting a representative. Well, and there's also a lot of evidence that um, if you run the same stack of ballots through scanners more than once, you often get a different total. Wow, that's convoluting the process quite a bit. Wow. Um, okay, so um, so Colorado might not necessarily be doing it better, um, the audit yet. system better yet. yet. Um, what about other states? Um, I don't know in detail how it's done. Um, Is there a state I, in particular that does it better than California that we could use as a model? Well, um, The laws vary. I think, as I mentioned before, uh, New Mexico involves some assumptions I'm not entirely happy with, mm -hmm. um, but it has a lot of sense behind it aside from that. Um, I don't know. I mean, the audit in New York is not great by you know, my judgment anyway. 
Um, there are states that have audit laws that might make some sense, but that their voting equipment doesn't actually support, so they can't really do an audit that matters. There really aren't terrific examples right now um, that I'm aware of, at, at least. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's exciting, though. We've got a lot of ground to, we've got a lot of um, work to do. Um, there, uh, of, of growing this movement um, of election integrity activists nationwide. That's what we're here doing today, is watering those seeds. Um, and obviously, we need national demand for better audits all across America. Obviously, we need more money into the system of, um, of elections to support better science, to support getting that science um, in play in our election process. Um, what are your feelings on the on the movement of the science um, towards so elections right I, now? I actually think that the the biggest hurdles are not scientific or statistical. Um, the the first thing we need is better rules for keeping track of the paper, um, better documentation of chain of custody. Um, I think we need a shift in attitude. Um, the way I characterize it is right now we have procedure-based elections. Election officials have some rules they're supposed to follow. I use this procedure, I use certified equipment, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, uh, what uh, David Wagner, a computer science professor at Berkeley, and I have been advocating is evidence-based elections, where instead you shift uh, the burden of proof on the local election official to say, um, you need to provide convincing evidence that the person or you say won really did win. Right. Um, it's not enough to follow procedures, you need to actually produce some evidence. In order to do that, you need to be keeping track of the ballots well, you need to be auditing adequately, so forth and so on. Um, if we had that shift, um, then a lot of things would follow from it. Um, one of the things that is difficult to do with currently deployed voting systems uh, in the U.S. is to audit efficiently. Um, a reason for that is that the, the things that we've been using for a while will only report um, the subtotals of the votes for batches of ballots on the scale of precincts. To audit efficiently, what you would really like to be able to do is to check the interpretation of individual ballots to know how the voting system um, you know, interpreted this particular ballot. Did it say it was a vote for Abraham Lincoln or not? Um, if you could do that, then the hand labor involved in auditing would be much, much, much less. Um, roughly the amount of work that you have to do to check the outcome scales, uh, it's sort of the number of batches you need to look at um, it, it is about the same regardless of whether those batches consist of one ballot or a thousand of ballots. Um, so the smaller you can get the batch size that the system will report, the less hand work there is in, in actually performing the audit. Um, so to get systems that are auditable at the ballot level would be, you know, a, a really high priority after ensuring that you've got a good um, chain of custody, um, a, you know, good strong affirmative evidence that the, that the audit trail itself is intact. The actual statistics of it, there are a number of ways of doing it. It's relatively well worked out. Um, that's not really the hard part. Um, uh, one of the hard parts is that the workload for doing a good audit does depend on the margin. And that means that local elections officials don't know before the election how much work the audit's going to be. If it ends up being a tight margin, it's going to be more work to audit. If it's a, a wide margin, it'll be involved less hand counting. Um, unpredictability is a very difficult thing for um, somebody running an election. I mean, local election officials have an awful lot of, of work to do. Um, uh, often run shorthanded. Often run shorthanded, underfunded, et cetera. That said, if we improved the equipment and, and shifted, um, you know, shifted the approach, we could vastly decrease the typical amount of work that's required to audit things. Um, the, you know, if the if the margins are, um, you know, ten percent or something, you know, like that in a particular contest, um, then you, you you might be able to uh, audit it um, and get substantial confidence about what's going on by looking at, you know hundreds, of, you know, a relatively small number of ballots from the entire contest, provided the voting system told you how it interpreted each individual ballot. Um, one thing to note is that the effort of auditing 
doesn't really depend on how many votes were cast. It depends on the margin as a percentage. So roughly the amount of work that's involved in auditing an election for the entire state of California is the same amount of work as involved in auditing uh, an election for city council, um, but it's spread out over the entire state. So um, my guess is that if we had, if we could get a state to be interested in doing what's called a ballot polling audit um, for this election, um, then at the level of the entire state, we might be able to confirm the outcome by looking at just a few hundred ballots. Mm -hmm. So voter demand for something of that nature would probably be um, the catalyst that pushes towards that outcome. Well, voter demand needs to be accompanied by um, political will among the legislators and the Secretary of State's office. Um, we, you know, there are places where doing an audit like that would be actually illegal. Um, so we need to ask for it, but we shouldn't expect that we're going to be able to shift things um, without laws changing. That said, um, it would certainly be delicious to see one or more states that have paper um, auditing the presidential election in November. It wouldn't Absolutely. be that much work. Absolutely. As an ICU nurse, I very much um, appreciate um, the idea of best practice protocols. Mm -hmm. I know that best practice protocols um, save lives. And um, evidence-based practice is what is the mindset that we are charged with at the bedside. Um, all the way up to administration when we want to make changes um, that uh, may be outside of the norm of standard of care um, to progress, um, you know, the, to use more, the most progressive research. Uh, we can't just be out there winging it mm -hmm. um, on our own. Um, and a completely um, different set of protocols seems to be in play in every county in the state of California. Um, which makes it very difficult um, to um, monitor what's going on across the entire state. So standardizing the system where there could be um, an accepted set of protocols that's used in every county that would be the same in Humboldt County as, this, as it is in San Diego seems to be um, the quickest way or the most efficient way to get to this outcome that we're looking for. So I'm not sure there is a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, I think that what works for a small county um, is not necessarily going to work for Los Angeles County or vice versa. Um, that said, I think that you know the rule that should be you know inviolable. The question we should ask. I, I don't know if you remember the public service announcements um, from when I was a kid. It's like you know it's it's twelve o'clock at night. You know where your kids are. Right. So it's like it's the morning after the election. Do you know where your ballots are? I like it. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> to some extent, we need that on a commercial. <laughs> we, we kind of need that as an attitude. I think mm -hmm. um, that uh, they're just. In what, are, what standards should we have? We should absolutely, every local election official should be able to tell you how many ballots they received and how they're organized. They should be able to say, you know, I've got whatever, 623,917 ballots. They're organized into this many boxes. Box so-and-so, box this and this has this many ballots in it. Um, things on that level. I call that a ballot manifest by analogy to like a shipping manifest on a shipping container that sort of says what's inside. So that's the first thing we need to be able to audit effectively and it's some of the first thing I think we need to really be able to ensure election integrity is really good tracking of the paper. Um, we should have um, really strong rules. Now I'm not saying that many jurisdictions don't do this already but there are definitely some that don't do this. Um, so th you should be able to say, I printed this many ballots, I sent this many out to this polling place, this many came back voted, this many came back spoiled, this many came back, um, you know, blank. Um, I should many know. of the questions that our ballot monitoring observation teams that we put on the ground within two weeks of the June 7th primary with ballots for burning, we mm -hmm. had teams in 58 counties in two weeks. That's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're pretty proud of that. Um, but um, novices that we were, we had many of these same questions um, when we went to observe the ballot count. And in some counties, we were giving given, um, you know, a, a very good explanation. Um, 
go home and sleep well on it at night. And other counties, um, we didn't get any information at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it even went to um, the extent of, a, you know, sending FOIAs to get the information that we were looking for as voters that we have a right to see. Mm -hmm. um. Is there a question? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you know, um, I'm, I'm more or less agreeing with what you just said. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we need good ballot accounting. We need rigorous ballot accounting. We need we need to know the organization of the ballots um, to be able to find individual ballots and know what's going on and, and sample from them. We need to cross check. Uh, the reported results um, to be able to do sanity checks and sniff tests against things like the number of registered voters in the um, who should be eligible to vote in a particular polling place, the number of ballots that came back, so forth and so on. And there's an example, I think, 2004 in Ohio, yeah. where you know thousands of ballots oh, you know, boy, were, yeah. Yeah, were, mm -hmm. were voted in a jurisdiction that, that had you know, right. a tenth as many registered voters. Um, so that kind of thing just shouldn't make it into final results that ought to get caught much, much mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, are there other proposals out for audits right now? In what sense? Are there other laws being proposed? Different types of audits than maybe what you're talking about. Well, states are, and I, I guess in the time that I've been involved in this, I've been aware of changes to laws in New York, New Jersey, Florida, um, New Mexico, Colorado. Um, none, none of those other than Colorado went to a risk-limiting audit per se. On the academic side, there are proposals for other approaches to auditing, including um, Bayesian audits. Um, the, Tell us what that is. Well, um, in 30 it, seconds or less. <laughs> in 30 seconds or less, yeah. Yeah. Um, It basically involves taking your own prior uh, beliefs or prejudices about how things should be and then looking and then taking some data on ballots again by taking a random sample and looking at them and using that to update that to see, assess the strength of the evidence that the outcome is right. The biggest difference between a risk limiting audit and a Bayesian audit conceptually is um, how well wh what counts as evidence. Um, and basically, so both are looking for science for, strong. for the hunch, and that is that what I'm hearing. No, I, I think this can be made um, quite rigorous. Um, uh, the the thing is, if you do a Bayesian audit different parties involved in the audit might have different priors and would be content with the audit stopping at different times um, or after effective manually. Um, if you keep going until all parties are satisfied, I think that that's a reasonable approach to things. Um, but it does involve uh, a subjective element. On the other hand, kind of the point of elections is to convince the losers that they lost fair and square. Mm -hmm. um, and so if what you're doing isn't convincing to the loser, the loser supporters, um, you have a political problem at least, if not a technical problem. Yes. Yes. And uh, I think we may be in the midst of that. Um, so let's talk about chain of custody and um, why it is important. And can that be audited as well? Well, again, if you don't have good chain of custody of the of the ballots of the sort of durable record of how people voted, then there's nothing to check against. Um, you really need need to to know that. Can it be audited? Um, of course, uh, provided you set up your system in a way that that gives you things you can check. Um, you ought to be able to tell whether you know a box of ballots fell off a truck or fell on a truck. Um, <laughs> You know, in the course of getting from the polling place to the central uh, county um, uh, office, <clears throat> but um, you also ought to be developing really good protocols around physical seals on boxes of ballots and things like that. Again, some counties do some uh, local local election officials do a good job. Others um, don't put as much care into it, but. Um, you know, the SEAL protocols are actually um, a, a good example. Um, 
Roger Johnston, who's at um, Argonne National Lab and works on security for nuclear devices and things like that. He's an expert on physical security of all kinds of things. Got involved in looking at elections at one point. Sounds like a good guy to do that job. Good guy for that <laughs> job. Um, and noticed practices where people would do things like put security seals on the box of ballots, but you could flip the box upside down and open the bottom without opening the seal. Wow. Right? So, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we need to interview that guy. <laughs> so, um, viewers at home, thank you so much for tuning in. We are here with uh, Dr. Philip Stark from the University of California Berkeley campus talking about risk limiting audits and audits in general. We appreciate all of your questions. Thank you so much. We have a few that have come in so far. So let's see, let's take, um, will California eventually switch to mail-in like Oregon? I hope not. <laughs> um, I, I have no idea. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Jim, you have to give Hi, Jim back. Soper here. There is a bill, SB 450, that is awaiting signature by the governor, which will allow counties to choose to opt into a system that follows a Colorado, what's called the Colorado model. If the county so chooses, everybody will get a vote-by-mail ballot, whether they ask for it or not. The, if they do that, then they also have to set up a vote center, uh, which will be one vote from days 10 through 5 before the election. The vote centers will be open for those days, uh, about one vote center for every 50,000 people. And then four days before the election, one vote center for every 10,000 people. So that's not an all vote by mail system. But we will see it. We probably will see an increase in vote by mail if the governor signs this, which I totally believe he will, because it has the backing of the of the Democratic Party and the election leadership in Sacramento. And then it comes the question whether or not the counties are going to want to do that, and that's up to the individual counties. If I were a registrar, I'd want to do it because it's going to simplify, I don't want to go into the explanation here, it's going to simplify the logistics of running an election. You can have the same staff working in those vote centers for 10, 11 days, figure out where your problems are, get them worked out instead of trying to do everything on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And it's got to work on Tuesday and you don't have any practice time or any of that, they're going to be able to start off 11 days and get those things worked out. Mm -hmm. From a logistics point of view, and I was a senior consultant for a large computer company, we, we understood that the most important part of any computerized system is the people. Mm -hmm. And this will help that. So it won't be all, but all mail in. You will be able to go in and vote at any vote center in the county and you'll be able to re-register or register on the spot. So those are some big changes. We're going to talk about that in more depth at the conference. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking about that on October 9th, um, specifically about the SB 450 and some of the major changes. This was a big year for new election laws, and we'll be talking about those changes coming up. And so I'm sorry you're not going to be able to be at the conference. Uh, out of town, sorry, actually, for, for other stuff to do with election integrity, uh, yeah. a meeting for the election no verification. No at all. You can <laughs> we're, watch we're, it on we're, our live stream. <laughs> <laughs> we're happy that you were able to join us here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Stark, we do have a question for you. Um, do you have any thoughts on audits on vote centers? Uh, the same principles apply if uh, you do a good job of keeping track of the ballots and organizing the ballots, then you can draw a random sample of them and use that to assess the evidence that the outcome is right and uh, do more, if you look at more if the evidence isn't strong, um, up to and possibly including a full hand count. Um, so having a vote center per se doesn't really change anything other than that you end up getting a mix of different ballot styles in the same place that are typically not physically sorted. 
So if you want to audit um, a small contest, if you're, if you're interested in, in confirming that you know, the election for dog catcher went right, you somehow are going to want to isolate all the ballots that have that contest on them. Um, and that will involve some sorting of the ballots that are, that are cast in vote centers. So um, again, we're back to the logistics of how the local election official manages the paper. Um, and that's, uh, that's something where there's you know, tremendous um, variability across jurisdictions. There are some places that have um, mechanical uh, sorters um, and uh, can you know sort uh, sort envelopes depending on uh, what the you know the zip code is or barcode or something like that from uh, where the where the voters you know coming from the address which would then have information about what the ballot style is inside because that determines the contest that they're eligible to vote in. There are other jurisdictions that don't. Um, it's it's going to be you know, be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Um, in your opinion, does that come down to funding? I mean, better funding is certainly counties, have well, better equipment, but they also have reason. more ballots to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not at all clear whether I mean funding obviously matters for everything, and um, even if, if it's staff time or technology or whatever, the funding definitely matters. But in general, you know, the, the way things go is the smaller counties have less money, but they also have fewer ballots to deal with. Um, and you get up to something like Los Angeles County, and it's impossible to do things without, you know, without good technology. There are jurisdictions that routinely hand count all of their ballots in addition to um, running them through, you know, optical scan uh, systems or whatnot. Um, that's not typically the case in big jurisdictions, it's small jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the need for technology depends on the number of voters that you've got. Could you walk us through, since we've talked about one style, certainly not going to fit all counties. Mm -hmm. Could you walk us through what your model um, large county would be in the state of California and perhaps what a uh, small county that you feel is, is getting it right? Well. I think conceptually it's the same. The difference is going to be the logistics of how you keep track of the ballots, so forth and so on. So if we took a state-level contest, I could describe a couple of different approaches to you know, auditing, say, the presidential election in November. What we need every state to do is to be able to say, I have this many ballots, um, and I understand the way that they're organized, um, so that uh, somebody could say to Alameda County, um, or Alameda County would say, I have X million ballots cast. How many ballots cast in Alameda County? Is that enough hand? Uh, Jim? It's on the order of a million? Yeah. They have 800, 700, 800 precincts, so what is that? Several hundred thousand. Several hundred thousand. It's yeah. less, less than a million, I would guess, but I don't, I don't know offhand. So, um, and, you know, similarly, Los Angeles County would say we have, you know, whatever, three million right. ballots cast or something like that. And then one way to do an audit would be to coordinate it at the state level and have the Secretary of State's office say, okay, overall the margin in the contest was X percent. Um, so we're going to need to look at at least this many ballots drawn from throughout the state in order to um, know whether we got the, the answer right. And then be able to say, Alameda County, give me um, the following six ballots. Mm -hmm. um, ballot number 1,297, ballot number you know, 176,000 ballots, and do the same thing for LA County and have them then report back what those ballots show. Mm -hmm. um, so how the county organizes its ballots is up to the county, but the ability to say they have this many ballots cast in this particular contest and the ability to retrieve a particular ballot so that conceptually the ballots are numbered. Um, and, you know, so you could say, here's my first box. It has 217 ballots. I'm going to call them number one through 217. Here's my second box. It has 195 ballots. That's going to be ballot number 218 through, you know, et cetera. And so that it makes sense to talk about give me ballot number such and such. That's what we need at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need to know that the ballots really are the ballots, that nothing has, you know, that we have them all and nothing has happened to them, so forth and so on. 
An alternative um, way to, I mean, now that would be for something that cuts across, you know, all of California's counties. Um, if we're talking about contests that are entirely contained in a single county, um, the the county should be, you know, can be drawing its own sample without direction from the state, so forth and so on. We do have quite a few registrars that are open to working with our BCOs, the ballot count observers, mm -hmm. um, and we have approached our um, registrar, Joseph Canzania, in um, Contra Costa County, mm -hmm. and we have been talking with his office about how we as um, citizens of Contra Costa County um, uh, who are um, interested in election integrity can work with the county, with the registrar's office, to um, meet some of these needs for transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and we have addressed... <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> have a little Blair Witch Project going on. Right? Okay, go take your drum, go put your drum and your patch behind your ear, and we'll be right back. Yeah, all right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes you drop a box of ballots on the floor. Yeah. And then it gets complicated. Yeah, right, right, right. We don't want to crucify people for that, but mm -hmm. we still want to know what happened. So um, in talking about how um, average grassroots activist interested um, voters can work with their registrar's office, what would be some, su some suggestions that you might give us as a BCO team to go in and try to get um, some of these policies that you're talking about or ideas initiated. I know that's a big ask. Yeah. <laughs> Take your time. Well, so first I should say I've, I've had the you know, pleasure and privilege of working with, I think it's about 15 different counties on mm -hmm. pilots of risk limiting audits mm -hmm. in California. That's impressive. Um, and they've been phenomenally they been generous with their time you, right? and forward looking. Wow. Well, um, opening the doors wide open would probably not be good policy. Um, uh, you kind of want to make sure that that, uh, that, well, that they're they were keeping track of what they're. They were welcoming. <laughs> they didn't give you the they keys to the, <laughs> the, the vote closet. They didn't leave me alone with the ballots. Um, uh, so, um, but you look like such a trustworthy guy. <laughs> and as I said, I'm not really political. So there you go. Um, the uh, I think that you know maybe encouraging um, your county to try a pilot of a risk limiting audit um, would be an interesting thing. The counties that have been open to trying it have basically come away uniformly thinking this is a way. This is something that at the end of the day is going to save them time and money, and gives them scientific evidence that they got the right answer at the end of the day. Um, and provides the public an assurance that if the answer was wrong, there's a big chance the answer will get corrected before it's before it's public, before it's official. Philip, yeah, is there something in the law that would prevent them from doing that? No, I believe that um, every jurisdiction can do a risk limiting audit in addition to what they're doing right now, and it would be um, wonderful if Secretary Padilla would. Um, allow them to do a risk limiting audit instead of the 1% audit. Um, when AV 2023 was in place, I believe that it did. And uh, I'm not sure what SB 360 says about that. I just don't remember the word the wording right now. But um, a nice thing that could happen at the state level is to empower local jurisdictions to do risk limiting audits instead of the 1% um, if they prefer, if should the, the Secretary of State's office should specify the risk limit that they should use, so forth and so on. Um, if So the counties that have, that have experimented with it so far have come away happy. Um, I don't, I, I, yeah, in, in fact, the, 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 the thing that happens um, uh, with some frequency is they, they say, wow, I didn't think spending a day with a statistician was going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that would be a wonderful thing because then I, I think that probably the largest resistance to moving to this is really from the local elections officials who justifiably um, have some concern about unpredictable workloads, procedures that they haven't tried before, um, whereas the familiar 1%, they've got that down, they know how many people it's going to take, they know how much work it is. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't give the assurance at the end of the day that the outcome's right. Dr. Stark, has anyone written an article that you know of so far on these 15 counties that have tried this 
risk limiting audit and are happy with the process and are possibly moving forward with doing it in the future? And is that the case? Will these 15 counties be moving forward with these RLAs? So I haven't had any conversations with these counties in the last couple of years about what's happening. The results of the pilot program in California were written up um, in uh, the final report of the Secretary of State's Office to the Election Assistance Commission um, after the, the to report on the funding that we received um, from the EAC. Uh, similarly, there's a report from Colorado on the pilot audits that, uh, that were done in several counties there. Um, I don't, anyway, I, I, I haven't heard anything from anyone planning to sort of independently pursue this at the county level absent some mandate from the Secretary of State's office to move forward, um, but that would be nice. 15 out of 58, that is 25%. Uh, a little bit more than twenty five on that order. Yeah, In includes some you know very large counties, like Orange County. Um, uh, Registrar voters, uh, Neil Kelly, uh, he's actually the uh, chairman of the advisory board of the Election Assistance Commission. Um, uh, Alameda County participated. Stanislaus, Merced, uh, Santa Cruz County, Marin County participated several times. Yolo County. Um, I'm Santa Luis Obispo, um, Santa Barbara, I mean, a lot of them. So comparing um, apples, to, apples to apples, and you would have to explain to me as the expert if this is possible, um, the funding that it takes to do the 1% county paper ballot audit versus the RLA seems to be that it's much less expensive. It could. Uh, be a time enhancing um, process where you're saving a lot of time, saving a lot of money. It seems like an easy sell. Um, where would we find out information about the funding? Because it seems like when you're going to the Secretary of State's office and um, going to your um, ROV offices, the thing that we hear most of the time is that we're underfunded, we're understaffed, um, we're, we're doing the best that we can. And it's hard to argue um, for more regulation when faced with that? Sure. So the answer is a little bit complicated, uh, in part because the amount of work that's involved in conducting a risk limiting audit depends on your voting technology. And as I mentioned before, uh, most of the systems that are currently deployed don't let you check how the system interpreted a particular ballot. That said, the voting systems in most counties are obsolete, um, or at least obsolescent, and there's likely to be a lot of replacements. Um, Los Angeles County is working on an open source voting system. Right. San Francisco County is working on an open source voting system. Travis County, Texas is developing one that's got both cryptographic verifiability and paper-based um, auditing baked in. Um, I'll stop you for just a second. So yeah. that type of technology could tell me ballot 1271 says says such Abraham such. Lincoln yeah right okay. um, so systems that support auditing at the level of individual ballots make the auditing much much less expensive in terms of the hand labor that said what gives a risk limiting audit its teeth is that you give is two things that you give narrower margins more scrutiny and secondly that it has the possibility of escalating to a full hand count if the answer is wrong um, so moving to risk limiting audits means there will occasionally be full hand counts, mm -hmm. at least when the answer is wrong, because that's the goal. The goal is to correct the answer if the answer is wrong, but to do as little work as possible if the answer is right. So the, all of these things you know, play in. I can't say that for every election it's going to be cheaper to do a risk limiting audit um, than it is to do the 1% hand count. That's not true. If, if, if for some reason some equipment failed, the ballot programming was wrong, something or other that caused the outcome to be wrong, then with high probability, a risk limiting audit is going to require a full hand count. That's more expensive than the 1%. On the other hand, uh, and if the margin is microscopically small, if you have, you know, if you have a, a margin that's decided by three ballots, um, you're pretty much resigning to do a full hand count if you're going to do a risk limiting audit of that. On the other hand, you could have a margin that's decided by a quarter of a percent, and if that quarter of a percent represents a lot of ballots, um, you might have to do an awful lot less work even than the current 1% does. Mm -hmm. um, the 1% is just not really based on any mathematics at all to give an assurance that the outcome is right. So um, 
as we were, I mean, my feeling, I would love to see California proceed in the following way. <laughs> um, first, we got to start keeping track of the paper. We really need um, good regulations around, you know, creating and curating a paper trail um, and being able to produce a ballot manifest for every county. Second, we need rules that say as voting systems get replaced, those voting systems need to support auditing at the ballot level. Mm -hmm. um, that money is going to get spent anyway, and it should get spent in a way that makes it easier to get election integrity. And third, I would like to see statewide contests um, audited using what's called ballot polling audits, which is a, a variety of risk limiting audits that don't require the voting system to report anything. It's basically like um, an exit poll, except unlike an exit poll, you're, you're instead of asking people how they voted, you're asking the ballots how they were voted. So wow. the ballots actually have to answer you, and they tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems with um, exit polls is that people don't always want to talk to you, and they right. don't always they don't always say that they did. And just just to be clear, yeah, that software is already available. There is no software required for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very straightforward. You can do the calculation with a pencil and paper. But yes, I actually have put software on the web to help people walk through the process. But that is going to require coordinating the logistics across counties. It is going to require the ability for the Secretary of State's office or some other entity to say, Alameda County, give me ballot number such and such. Go find it. Tell me what it says. Very interesting stuff. Um, we're going to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. We've got another question. Um, can we audit provisional ballots? So for an audit to do the right thing, that is to really be able to check the outcome of the election, you should be auditing the results after the canvas is done. And the canvas includes the provisional ballots. So doing the canvas involves resolving the status of the conditional ballots. So um, we should be auditing the provisionals. But by the time we do the audit, they shouldn't be distinguishable as provisional ballots anymore. They should be just part of the ballots cast in that precinct. Which, of course, was the big problem in San Diego. Um, by my understanding, the issue in San Diego isn't so much the provisionals as the vote by mail. Um, I don't think they're, my, my understanding, and I, I'm not really up on the facts, is that they're not including the, the provisionals or the vote by mail in their 1%. Mm -hmm. Right. So how can we say that we've got a, um, a representative sample in the 1% when we basically kept out almost half the votes? Certainly. Um, if you're only looking at half the votes, there's an awful lot of room for yeah. error or malfeasance <laughs> yeah. that you would never detect. Yeah. 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 So, Dr. Stark, um, could you offer any our ballot count observers any advice um, post-election, um, what we should be looking for? Um, the One of the biggest problems that we had um, it was not enthusiasm. It was not commitment. We got people on the ground, mm -hmm. but we got people on the ground that did not know exactly what they were doing. Um, and we were learning as we went along. And anything that we can do to enhance our BCO volunteers going into this ballot count would be very helpful. So I've seen some very good guidelines for election observers, um, and I can't recall who published them. I think it might be the Citizens for Election Integrity Minnesota, CEIMN. Mm -hmm. um, they may be linked to from the Verified Voting website as well, but they give some very good ideas of you know what you should be paying attention to. Um, I would say that um, Please be sensitive to the fact that the local elections officials have an incredibly difficult, mm -hmm. complicated job to do, mm -hmm. and try not to interfere with their doing their job. Mm -hmm. um, that said, uh, there are things that should be visible to you as an observer, including part of the you know the audit process. You ought to be able to, um, you know, observe well enough to know whether those votes are getting calculated, right? Not get across the room, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Stark, thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate you sharing your vast um, array of, 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 of understanding and um, on this subject. And thank you so much um, for um, this hour of your precious time. Folks. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Folks, uh, we would like to invite you to our Election Integrity Conference, Take Back the Vote, October 8th and 9th. 
in Richmond, California at Grace Lutheran Church. You can find our event page on Ballots for Bernie Facebook page. Um, please go ahead and RSVP. Let us know you're coming. We want to um, have enough space, enough chairs, um, be ready for all of your questions. Um, if you can't make it out to the conference, we will be live streaming on Ballots for Bernie um, from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m on Saturday and Sunday, and join us on trustvote.org. We have 12 lawsuits in play right now across the country. Um, lawsuits are not cheap. Um, we can use your $5 donation, your $10 donation. Every dollar counts. Thank you so much for joining us today again for another uh, episode of Ballots for Bernie. And again, thank you, Dr. Stark, for your time. We appreciate it. And will you come back and let us interview with you again? I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Thank appreciate you. it.